Thanks, Mike. So my presentation is quite a short one. I've got about a dozen slides, but I'm not going to talk to all of them in great detail. So this is really about the, the health and safety aspects of um, COVID-19. So if I turn to the first slide, I think what I'd like to start is by saying that we've all got a part to play in this. You know, and pandemics historically either end really badly or end not so badly. Um, when they end really badly, it's because the spread of the virus is very fast through the population. That then means that people, lots of people get ill at the same time, which overwhelms the health service. Um, consequently leading even to health professionals falling ill as well, which dips in the ability, makes it that the, the NHS have the ability to support people who are ill less so because some of them are ill as well. And basically it means that there, there's a lot more vitality. What, what we're looking to do, and the, the, the government, and I'm sure you're all aware, is to try and reduce that, that spike of um, cases. So if the cases are, are much lower, we get a, a much less bad outcome, and the health service can cope with the demand, and people get treated and uh, uh, recover. So. That's really, for me, that's the overall picture in terms of management of the pandemic that we all have a part to play in. So turning now specifically to health and safety, I want to speak about um, transmission and impacts on the symptoms and also mainly about managing the risks to do with health and safety. Um, this is, of course, is really quite fast moving. It's a fast moving agenda with the government updating information all the time. So what I would say is stay up to date with the Gov website, the NHS website on latest information and thinking about managing to control the virus. Um, so transmission of COVID-19, COVID it, it's a virus. The main transmission appears to be coughs, sneezes, so it's a droplet infection. And the droplets are passed from one person through coughing and picked up by another person. And the, the way that the virus comes into your body is through your mouth, your nose or your eyes. The other way, as it says on the slide, is that it, it can survive on surfaces for a few days. So if you pick up the virus on your hands and then touch your mouth, nose and eyes, then that's all, an, another way that you can con contract the virus. Um, and of course, just, just that, I think what one simple slide encompasses it all because that really picks up then all, all the ways you manage prevention in terms of reducing risk of transmission. Actually, luckily, it doesn't actually cause people to sneeze, um, and which is, I say luckily, because actually a sneeze projects um, droplets a lot further than a, than a you do typically. And uh, there's lots of advice around, you know, coughing into your elbow and using tissues and, and the like. Um, so turning to the next slide, what are the symptoms? Well, I'm sure you will have heard people talk about the symptoms. The key ones to think about are high temperature when someone's feeling hot in the chest, on the forehead or on the back, and a new continuous cough. And it's usually a dry cough. That's what people are reporting rather than mucus. So th those are the signs. The thing I'd emphasize is that managers should know um, what to do and following the, the official advice in terms of behaviours if somebody reports ill or if somebody appears to become unwell and may have the virus whilst they're at work and there's there is a whole a host of information about exclusion the seven day exclusion and exclusion to do with family members for those who are self-isolating and the like. I'm sure you've heard about all of that too um, moving on to the next slide. 
what, I, what I'm going to talk now really is about the, the considerations that we have for control of the virus. That's to do with hygiene practice when we're talking about washing our hands, cleaning surfaces, reducing contact, this whole idea of social distancing and how we can manage that in the workplace. Protective equipment. I think one thing I'd emphasise is that people often, in my experience, in my years in health and safety, rush to protective equipment and, and they focus on that. Whereas actually, I think in my experience, what's key is good procedure. So thinking about procedure in terms of managing the, the hazard, and this is a hazard, coronavirus is a hazard like any other hazard. So, so thinking of how we do all of these things, not necessarily focus specifically on PPE or personal protective equipment. And the other risk of that is sometimes PPE can make people feel superhuman or invulnerable, whereas, of course, we know that isn't the case. Um, ECA has done a really useful toolbox talk on this, which is freely available on our website. And that sets out lots of useful information about um, considerations for control. Because part of this is, of course, is getting the message over to everybody to take these, these um, actions seriously to make sure that they do wash their hands and follow the other general uh, guidance to reduce spread, that kind of thing. So, <laughs> I'll, I'll move on. I've got specifically just thinking about protective equipment on the right hand side that you can see uh, I've taken from that from the Public Health England website. It's actually aimed at medical practitioners, but it's quite useful information about taking off personal protective equipment. For example, you peeling off gloves so you're not touching the outside of the glove with your skin and disposing of them. Um, Likewise with other PPE, so safe disposal, because what the last thing you want to do is recontaminate your hands if you have um, virus on your personal protective equipment. And largely this is aimed, as I say, about for medical practitioners. But it's quite interesting and useful stuff that may not be appropriate for us in terms of the work that we do. So moving on to the next slide. Particularly, what we should focus on is maintaining regular hand hygiene, so cleaning your hands. And you will have heard the people talk about singing happy birthday twice and the like. Um, I heard it described as well about, um, imagine when you're washing your hands, imagine that you're, you've just been chopping hot chilies and you're about to put contact lenses in. So that's probably a good way to think about the amount of time you should spend. Make sure you include your thumbs as well. Um, reasons for this is, are, is of course, um, uh, viruses have, a, have a, a fat protein coating and the soap breaks off the receptor. So that's the thing that where, where a virus can attach to our cells to, to inject the, the, the DNA in that they do. So this breaks down the surface so they can't um, attach. And also the, the friction of washing your hands actually knocks the virus off. So, so that certainly a key thing to do. Secondly, avoiding contact with your eyes, mouth, face, um, with unclean hands, or as it's there, if, you, if you've still got gloves on. So it's important to get that message across so people get into good hygiene habits in terms of not touching their faces. And as I said there, not, not, um, not necessarily fully relying on PPE. PPE is one tool in the toolbox, but there are others as well. And I've got a, a slide about face marks, face masks, surely. The other thing I'll say that I haven't particularly noticed in, in other advice, and I haven't added here, is about cleaning surfaces. So um, um, I was speaking to somebody earlier who was talking about cleaning surfaces about antibacterial, anti antibacterial gel, which is typically 60% plus alcohol. For, for which is really useful for your hands, but it's less useful for cleaning surfaces because the, the bactericidal effect doesn't last as long. So I'm a fan of um, chlorine-based um, bleach products that are, you know, the, the cleaners, the little spray products that cleaners use. 
because chlorine lasts a lot longer on surfaces, so it has a bacterial effect for longer. Obviously, you must take account of the cost issues around safe use of chemicals. And I, th I think that's a particularly useful thing. And generally, cleaning things that you touch, you know, cleaning your tools at the end of the day, cleaning your tools when you're going to and from locations, not sharing. So turning now to reducing contact and proximity, this is really all about, partly about the web design. Again, turning to the, the CLC this morning issued the Site Operating Procedures Protecting Your Workforce document, which is a four-page document which is really useful and has information about trying to keep the two-metre two distance rule. Um, people have talked about changing shift patterns to have less people people going to and from site in their own vehicles, not sharing vehicles and the like, where all these things are possible. Um, all to re reduce the, the physical contact that people have with each other. Also adding, adding um, avoiding direct skin contacts and not shaking hands, so people are doing the elbow bump and things like that, or the foot bump and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, not having contact with someone who uh, is appearing unwell. And that links with what I said earlier about making sure that there's process for somebody who's feeling well, including thinking about how, how somebody gets home if they're, they're not very well. So, so that's generally the, the, the um, on-site issues around reducing contact. I'm just checking to see if I've got any, anything else on my notes on that. Um, No, I haven't got anything else on my notes on that. Um, the, the, the site operating procedures also talk about access, you know, denying access to visitors and the like. It's only essential people. So turning to the next slide, talking very briefly about face masks. Generally, the, the thinking is that they're for um, people in the medical profession rather than us in terms of use. They don't fully protect against a virus the the class that because virus is a nanoparticle that, that actually the where it says um i.e 0.01 should be an n rather than n it's a nanoparticle rather than a micro particle so they're obviously very very small um and interestingly the the uh, the surgeon's masks are really designed to stop surgeons breathing bacteria out from the patient rather rather than in um, so there, there's a general issue with masks anyway in terms of fit, so they have to fit well. Um, I often say sometimes that they should fit so they're almost a little bit uncomfortable at that time. Um, we, have, we, have, we do have advice about um, face masks and beards also, and um, facial hair on our websites as well. Um, so as it says there, that some, some might be able to protect against the disease. Um, they're expensive and also they can get in the way of, of work performance as well. There are other issues as well around taking them off and, and cross-contamination as well. And also, you know, as I can see somebody's popped up a, a point there, you can't actually get them. So actually being able to get hold of them. Um, so, the next slide. Just moving on to the next slide. Preventing illness on site. We've talked about that already, about not turning up, up if you're not feeling well, and also making sure people understand about what to do if they're unwell. Um, denying access. Uh, so they're really the, the main points I wanted to get across. Um, this is all typical advice that you would have on the um, government website for do's and don'ts as well about general guidance. So that's the end of the presentation, Mike. I don't know if you're there and you can hear me. Thanks, Paul. That's, that's really helpful. Um, we're going to move on now to uh, Rob's presentation. Rob will be talking about legal and commercial issues, and we'll take some of your questions after his presentation. Morning, everybody. I'm the uh, Legal and Business Director for ECA. Uh, 
by the way before i get going into this all of our advice and guidance notes are freely downloadable from our website which is open to all members and non-members alike so some of the issues i will cover will be covered in more detail in the guidance notes for anybody who might be scribbling things down um, please also bear in mind that as we prepared these it was um, prepared pre-lockdown announcements last night by the prime minister uh, so we will try and adapt the materials to suit um, the first uh, step we took was talking about business mitigation and business continuity, where plans were being put in place a week or two weeks or three weeks ago by various contractors to analyse their businesses and figure out exactly what could be done remotely, by whom. Some contractors were moving teams into separate facilities, some teams working from home remotely, some contractors were also focusing on their IT systems, their files, how they record variations, the nuts and bolts of your ordering, your invoicing and other, other things. So, so these are some of the key areas that businesses should have been focusing on and should still be focusing on in terms of trying to maintain their business operations throughout these periods. So you've got your IT and digitization, and that could come down within the micro businesses and small businesses down to simply using Dropbox and cloud-based solutions more. Focusing, as, as Paul uh, Williams has just covered, on health and safety issues, looking after your people. And again, Andrew will cover the, some of the people aspects later. Processes, how you do things, whether there's a secondary layer of authority if somebody has to self-isolate and come out of the working system. Um, and that's about the how you're going to authorise and carry on any continuity of services. I know there are lots of comments around whether services and works are stopping but we will address those in a second uh, second point is to talk uh, we, we don't tend to talk in, in, in all the inquiries we deal with um, seldom do contractors necessarily want to talk to their clients or their end clients um, but at this time more than ever it is worth having conversations with the end clients on their covid positions those in fm were asking us a couple of weeks ago, I'm not entirely sure what's going to happen to my work. What do I do? Well, in the FM sector, the easiest thing to do was ask the client what their COVID-19 plans were and how they wanted to handle their ongoing maintenance issues. Um, so another example of where it's worth talking to the funders, your existing funders, and we'll move into some of the government support in a second. HMRC. <clears throat> They prefer it if you talk to them before your tax bill is due and then they can put measures in place to help you. Safety, uh, that's really been covered. Communications, how are you going to communicate? What is the preferred method? What you don't want is within your organisation is some people trying to use WhatsApp, Messenger, all sorts of various uh, levels of communications. You want to be able to come out of this with a clean record keeping system um, so that you can look back and chart and measure what you need to do next. Programming and cash flow. Uh, businesses that we've been speaking to have been modelling their cash flow based on things like furloughing or layoffs or how their those conversations with the clients have panned out on who wants them to maintain operational existence on sites or in built assets. Um, and that will help you do two things, model your programming, your staffing requirements and your cash flow requirements in terms of what debts you can try and get back to, to continue operations and help your survival through this fairly stressful time. So digging down a level deeper, um, we are where we are. Um, when we do our general commercial awareness webinars, uh, we talk about how 90% of the contracts in the industry are based on the contracts on the right, the standard forms, which is JCT or any NEC. However, approximately about 80% of the 90% are usually amended by the client, whether it be main contractor or end user. Um, all construction contracts will contain clauses which we usually skip over and force majeure is being banded around at the moment quite heavily as the answer to everything contractually around COVID-19. To translate that, force majeure is 
French for an act of God. So an issue which is beyond both parties' regional control. The reality, though, is that force majeure may or may not be defined in the contract. And you have to pull, as we answer most inquiries with, pull the contract out of the drawer, have a look at it and get to grips with the mechanics of how the contract allows you to operate. Um, so at the moment, uh, you would need to check the force majeure clause, see whether there is one and what it says. Frustration, that's mentioned in the government guidance. It's, um, it's the principle of law whereby contracts can be frustrated from being able to be performed and it lets both parties off further performance. However, it doesn't allow parties to get compensation for the loss of work going forward. You also may find that your contract has suspension provisions. It may be that the force majeure clause leads into that. One of the consequences of the act of God may be that the contract is suspended for a period of time and it will explain the mechanics of that procedure, who serves what notice, when, how. And that may cumulatively for suspension over a prolonged period allow a party to terminate the contract. If so, termination or suspension or force majeure might then allow you and tell you what you can and cannot claim for. Um, your claims management must be absolutely exemplary, it must focus on whether you need extra time, loss and expense, those two terms are synonymous with JCTs or in NEC language that would be a compensation event. It's worth noting here that force majeure under JCT gives you time but not money to allow you extra time to complete the works. Whereas NEC, it does form a compensation event, which would give you both time and money. But what it wouldn't do, if there is a what they call a Z clause, a clause amending the standard form drafting, quite often they remove the right to money. And under NEC, they also have to make those claims within eight weeks or you're barred from doing so. Lots of contracts with facilities like this in also put a duty to mitigate. So a duty to mitigate is the onus on you, the contractor, to say you can make a claim for extra time and or money, but what you must do is take steps to minimize the impact on the project. And that can be expressed in a couple of ways. It can be do everything necessary. Now that is literally everything, or it could be do everything reasonable, which is do all that another contractor would do in the circumstances to prevent the delay or the cost consequences. Um, so contract management is going to be absolutely key and imperative when we come out the other side of COVID-19 in terms of business continuity and the financial integrity of your businesses. It's also worth asking, we've had a lot of inquiries, we've been monitoring the, tr the flow of traffic through ECA and what those hot topics are about. A lot of it can be about insurance. Um, I'm going to start off with business interruption insurance. Those that do have it are finding it generally not that worthwhile because it excludes pandemics. And the government has issued that advice that it is very rare for business interruption insurance to cover pandemics. Check your policy, check your wording. If it is, as we suspect, excluding pandemics, it will not kick in. And it only does tend to kick in for damage to property. Um, Public liability and employer's liability insurance, both policies you have to maintain and cover. And this kind of dovetails with what Paul Williams uh, covered, which is if you do continue to work and you are on sites, you still have a duty of care to the public and to your employees, which you reinsure that risk that you might get sued for a breach of that duty by taking out insurance. To make sure you don't negate that insurance, you should always work within the parameters of your policies. So it might be worth again dusting off the policies or just asking the basic question to your insurers. What do you require of me at this time in order to function inside my insurance? Notices, I just wanted to say um, this will be chaos at the moment out there and we, we already know because we're monitoring the calls that it is. Make sure you, all your correspondence with other parties are uh, sent in accordance with the contract so that they are official. You wouldn't want to send a WhatsApp asking for 
an extension of time only to find out five months down the line that your client says, well, you didn't send it in the post. The contract requires under a different clause that it must be sent in the post first class recorded delivery mail. So you need to follow the contracts in that respect too. Time bars and conditions precedent. That is, as I said before, things like NEC contracts say that if you don't make your claims within eight weeks, you are barred from doing so. Lots of bespoke contracts also have that in it. Um, and there may be conditions precedent as well. So you must, a condition precedent would be, thou shalt give all reasonably supporting inf information and data required in order to claim an extension of time. So you must do your obligation before you have the right to extra time or money. And again, a change in law clause. Usually very um, standard and, and bypassed by most of us. But if the COVID-19 bill comes in and government issues these orders based on regulations or legislation, you might not be looking at force majeure, you might be looking at the law has changed, who carries the risk, what does the clause say, and can I claim at time and or money as a result of that change? Government support and advice. And here we're getting to some of the number of the issue. Um, Andrew will comment from his side, from an employee relations side in a second. Uh, but I will cover some of the business issues um, and start to take us towards the nub of what some of the comments are about, which is what's happening about site closures across the UK and where we stand. So how government works is we think of it as one conglomerate mass. It is about 35% of demand in UK construction, but it does not act cohesively. It can only issue PPNs, public procurement notes or policy procurement notes to itself to encourage all the different points in local and central government and other parts of the public sector to follow the same method of procuring works, goods and services. So, so far in the last 10 days, we've had PPN 01 and 02. The first one was really useful. It threw all the rules of tendering out the window and allowed public sector authorities, which is most of them, but there are some excluded. And again, this is where I say check the guidance notes for details. They're all available on our website for free. Covered procurement rules, as I said, it threw all the procurement rules out the window and subject to certain tests, it allows the public sector contracting authority to continue to procure goods, work, services, especially and specifically those relating to the continuation of public sector services within the COVID-19 outbreak. We still need our hospitals, schools and other facilities to work. PPN02, this is about business continuity and dis dissemination of cash for those that work with the public sector. This is uncharted territory and an unprecedented help it allows the public sector to make advanced payments, to make prepayments, to temporarily suspend certain contract provisions. If you're paid in relation to key performance indicators or on a service credit basis, um, it can potentially be used to release retentions early. But I would say that both PPNs do not tell government what to do. They enable government to make those decisions should they wish to do so in order to prevent the collapse of the supply chain and to ensure business continuity at the other end of this pandemic outbreak. Uh, essential workers. The word essential, key or critical so far has meant those workers who can send their children to school after the school closures were announced. And that was the limit of it. However, after last night's announcement, the big question is what stays open? And the questions being asked of us are, are these people essential? Are our activities essential? I think so far we don't have an answer to that because the government haven't answered that. In Scotland, the First Minister has stepped forward and seems to have shut construction down. Undoubtedly, in the UK, there will be public sector built assets that are required to continue to operate 
throughout the pandemic crisis. And I think government will uh, take a position on this in the coming hours, if not a couple of days, as to how that works. So at the moment, sites are still open unless the client or the main contractor has chosen to shut them. We have advice from Paul Williams about health and safety, which culminates in the industry's efforts to establish site operating procedures as to how you continue to run sites and manage the risk to health and safety of COVID-19. We've mentioned insurance, employers liability, public liability insurance, and that you need to stay inside your insurance parameters, but look after your people if you're going to continue to operate. And now on this page, we've mentioned the public sector's uh, ability through procurement and payment, as well as um, identifying that some of the built assets, at least within the public sector, will need to continue function. As I mentioned, schools, hospitals, and other key infrastructure and construction will have to play their part in that, but in a safe and critical way. Um, I'll let Andrew talk about SSP, which is statutory sick pay, but I want to touch on, on tax. Most people don't talk to HMRC, they don't like HMRC. It is worth saying that in the, the IR35 has been moved back a year, reverse VAT doesn't come into October, but at present is still expected to come in. But throughout the Carillion crisis and before, HMRC operated time to pay. That is a system whereby if you talk to HMRC honestly and directly upfront about your tax liabilities before the money is due, they can arrange a repayment system with you that is more flexible and, and less rigid and give you some leeway and space to help with that. In terms of income tax, there's been a delay to uh, filing and, and paying those and a, th a three month window. There is a business interruptions loan scheme a guidance notice on that and the details of how you access that. If you earn, if the turnover of your company is 41 million or less, they can help with loans of up to 5 million through your retail lenders, where the lenders get a guarantee from the government behind them that you will pay them back. There is a business plan requirement to be in place in order to access those loans. But as I say, if you access our guidance notes, you can learn more about that, as well as the Bank of England for major large businesses, uh, loans and corporate finance system. Um, we have details on all of this on, on the website and each announcement brings more guidance from us. Okay, thanks, Rob. Uh, Mike here. So yeah, as Rob said, if you go to www.eca.co.uk forward slash coronavirus, you have a lot of different guidance from our experts, including uh, Rob and Andrew. Uh, I, obviously, you've noted a lot of the questions relate to employment and Andrew will pick those up and he's already covering some in the chat. But just a couple of quick ones for Rob. Uh, Rob, one of the questions was, um, what, what should a business do contractually, particularly if there's no force majeure contract, if they're not willing or able to go to site any longer and uh, they're being potentially threatened with legal action, what, what should they do? Um, so it really does depend on your contract. If you are in contract, even if it's the back of the serviette style contract, um, in other words, the real terms and conditions or anything, but you are obliged to complete the works by a given date, you have a contractual obligation. If you choose not to fulfil that co contractual obligation in response to the threat on human life, that is your decision to take. And there may be uh, legal repercussions later for your business. Um, if your business was not around, there, there would be no one for them to do. And I'm making some very bold, high level, blunt statements there. Um, the, the, there is no implied force majeure clause. Uh, you would be able to claim a reasonable extension of time where you are prevented from carrying out the works. So if they have closed the site on you and, and stopped you accessing it, you cannot perform your contractual obligations. You would have an automatic right to a, an extension of time. If they are simply telling you, you are obliged to be here and do the works, 
then you revert back to your obligation is there to, to do the works, but you need to, under the standard operating procedure rules that industry has published today, take the appropriate health and safety measures and put them in place in order to carry on. At present, the government has not ordered the closure of construction. OK, one more, Rob, and then we'll move on to Andrew. Yep. So if you're an SME and you're being told, you know, don't come to site any longer, and that obviously brings with it a lot of implications in terms of losses of earnings and ability to potentially continue with some of the work, what are, what are the two or three key things you should do next? If the tap has turned off, so your sites have closed and your clients have told you not to come, I guess you've got to... Uh, listen to Andrew's advice next about how you manage your labour force, which is your most flexible overhead. Uh, go through your financial position and figure out what you can um, quickly and fluidly uh, shelve in terms of your overheads to manage your position and try and recover as much cash into it as possible. Have a constructive conversation with HMRC and think about your lending facilities. It's not something anybody wants to do, but we are in a position where many of the challenges and decisions you are facing individually are not any challenges or decisions anybody wants to face right now. So we have a mix. We have uh, views coming out of people that say, we don't want to send our people on site. They're too scared. They don't want to be there, but we're being forced to maintain a presence on site and we've got others saying we think we may not survive this because all of our sites are shut. Um, my suspicion is that the government will have to take a position at, at some point. That position will be better, I think, in collaboration with industry rather than unilaterally made in abstract. Uh, but there is a definitive need for the built assets within the public sector, as I say, the hospitals and everything, to continue to operate, and they will need our support to do that. Anything else, Mike? No, that's that's it. Thank you, Rob. Um, just before I move on to Andrew, just want to read out one comment made by my colleague Paul Reeve. Um, this relates to a meeting just out of uh, Bayes, the uh, Department for Business, this morning. He says, um, "Work can proceed if it meets the new SOP, and this includes hygiene and distancing. If it cannot meet," the uh, SOP, then it should not be happening, essentially. Uh, I'll post a link to the SOP right now so you can all take a look at what I'm referring to. It's the site operating process. Uh, over to you, Andrew. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, I'm going to um, deal, first of all, with a couple of areas where we know quite a lot. Uh, then I'll move on to an area where there's still a lot of unknowns. And I have to say, from looking at the comments, um, a level of confusion, um, given the absence of clear direction by uh, the government. Um, as with Rob, a health warning um, on the slides, they were put together um, over the weekend, and there's one particular area uh, that uh, which I'll have to correct, but I'll tell you that um, when I get to it. Um, what we know a fair bit about is statutory sick pay, so I'm not going to labour that. Uh, obviously, uh, you're aware that what the government decided to do was to waive the normal three-day waiting period, and they also define those who can uh, receive uh, statutory sick pay, and it is just statutory sick pay I'm talking about at the moment. We'll come on to JIB sick pay later. But with regard to statutory sick pay, they've broadened the range of people who can, uh, for whom it can be paid, uh, not just those uh, diagnosed with um, coronavirus, but also those who are self-isolating on medical advice, uh, such as from NHS uh, 111, and indeed people who are caring uh, for others who fall either within those two categories. Um, and there is, at the same time, uh, a facility, uh, in theory at least, uh, for small and medium-sized employers to reclaim up to two weeks SSP in those circumstances. Uh, I only say in theory uh, because I noticed one of the questions 
um, was, uh, uh, is, the rate, is the repayment mechanism in place yet? Uh, and I've seen no evidence so far that it is. Uh, all we have is the promise from the government that when it is in place, that employers will be able to claim. Um, moving on to another area, uh, and I will, this is another area where we know quite a lot, uh, but is clearly um, of, of broader significance now, uh, potentially, than when it was first published. Um, this, this discussion of critical workers uh, really relates purely to the information that government put out about school closures. So, to my knowledge, uh, the only official uh, information and definition of what is a critical worker is in a document uh, called Guidance for Schools, Child Care Providers, Colleges and Local Authorities, uh, and that's available on gov.uk. Um, and there, as you will see uh, from the slide, uh, there, there are a range of sectors that are defined as having critical workers. In fact, if you go to the guidance, there is actually a broader range of sectors. But importantly for us, it does not talk about electricians per se. It does not talk about fire and security people per se. Um, but what it does do, it does relate to some areas that we service, some sectors that we service, um, and therefore, arguably, uh, if your employees uh, want to argue with the school um, that uh, they are critical workers, that gives them some scope to do so. But I, I do commend you uh, to look at that guidance. Um, there are links on the coronavirus uh, webpage on our website, but obviously, as, as Rob has already outlined and as the comments um, identify, this issue, which purely was uh, concerned with uh, access to schools, is now becoming a lot broader. Um, uh, but um, the only official word on it so far uh, is in relation uh, to schools. Okay. Uh, comment, we have electricians setting up facilities at hospitals, um, I see there, what do we work for the NHS? Again, I am purely narrowly basing uh, what I'm going to say about access to schools. I think you have an argument there. Uh, the issue, of course, is uh, that the guidance from the, the government is very broad, and who decides uh, whether you fall that side, the right side or the wrong side, where well, it's the head teacher. Um, clearly, as I said, these arguments are going to have a more uh, commercial um, focus uh, when uh, we, we uh, now that we've entered this current stage um, of lockdown. But at the moment, there is no clear guidance on, on that from the government. We're hoping for some clearer guidance uh, sometime soon, hopefully today. Um, moving on, and this, of course, is the really important one. And unfortunately, it's the one uh, area where at the moment we know least. Um, the Chancellor obviously announced uh, the job retention scheme only on Friday afternoon. It made a very big uh, splash, but the reality is we don't know very much. What we do know is the government have in principle agreed to pay 80%. Now, the term I use on the slide is salary. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more in a sec. But anyway, we'll pay 80%. Uh, up to £2,500 a month, backdated to the 1st of March. First point to make, I've used the term salary there, and that is the term uh, that the Chancellor used. That is the term that appears in some of the government guidance. Rather unhelpfully, in other parts of government guidance, it talks about employer costs or wage costs. That, of course, potentially then broadens out what is encompassed uh, within the figure um, that you uh, then calculate the 80% on. Uh, so does it include overtime? Does it include pension? At the moment, we do not know. Um, we do not know. There is no clarity on what is included or excluded beyond what's been published. Um, uh, and is reproduced very clearly, I have to say, in uh, the ECA uh, guidance, uh, managing 
uh, business disruption, which is on the coronavirus webpage. I think actually on the webpage itself, it's called managing workplace disruption. We do need to correct that, but but you get you get the drift. Uh, and if you look on there, that really is the authoritative document. I would look at look at that and read that and and take note of that. It was updated yesterday. Take note of that rather than anything else you might be picking up on on the internet or through social media. Um, another question uh, that's been asked on the on the um, uh, on sort of flow of, of queries um, is um, does the employer have to top it up um, certainly the chancellor was very clear on that no uh, the the 80 percent uh, is 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 a cap uh, if the employer chooses to top up and this these are the words of the chancellor the employer may choose to top up but does not have to um, who qualifies? Who, who can be put on to uh, furlough? Um, well, as far as uh, the information we've got so far, again, that seems pretty clear. Uh, it's, it's people who otherwise, if they weren't put on furlough, if they weren't uh, sent home, would either be made uh, redundant or, or laid off. In other words, there isn't work for them uh, to do. Um, question, what about self-employed sole traders, partnerships, LLPs? Uh, no, this applies only to employees, and that's because the system of payments, which of course isn't up and running yet, yet, yet but the system of payments um, is, is operated through the PAYE system. Um, the idea appears to be uh, that the PAYE system will go into reverse um, and HMRC uh, will uh, pay employers um, through the PAYE system rather than taking money um, away. Uh, obviously, PAYE payroll doesn't operate for self-employed. In terms of what happens to the self-employed, we're still waiting for the government to expand on, on the range of measures uh, that they've so far announced. Um, uh, uh, as a, a, an ECA policy position, it is uh, we, we feel that more needs to be done, and we're hopeful that the government will do more. But at the moment, uh, they're essentially saying uh, that um, self-employed need to rely on the benefit system. Um, other information. Um, uh, in terms of furlough, something else to mention, again, referring to that guidance, um, the guidance on the coronavirus website is, is up to date and it does include guidance on how you go about uh, putting employees on furlough and indeed it contains a sample letter uh, which you can use to that purpose. Other information as you can see on the slide, although in principle you can backdate to the 1st of March for employees who fill, fulfill uh, the requirements, um, it looks like uh, the, the first payments will only get through to you uh, on the end uh, at the end of April. And so um, what uh, the, um, the government uh, is, is saying is if that causes uh, an issue in terms of, of, of cash flow uh, and so on, then apply for one of the uh, loan schemes uh, that they've announced already. That, that may be helpful, that may not be helpful. But in terms of uh, the, the principle of what's happening with regard to furlough, the first money is only going to f find its way uh, to employers at the end of April. Um, you will have to divide your workforce into working and furloughed employees. Clearly, if uh, you're in a situation where there is no work uh, for anybody, then presumably everybody will be furloughed. Um, it may vary depending upon the company, of course. There'll be many companies who probably have to split people on the base of what contracts uh, they're working on. And this is a very important point, uh, and I've noticed that some people ha have uh, picked up uh, on this uh, already. Furloughed, it's, it's binary. It's binary. You're either working, uh, in which case uh, uh, the employer uh, picks up uh, the tab, or you're furloughed. Um, obviously, there'll be people on sick pay as well, but in terms of the, those not on, on, on the sick, uh, uh, furloughed employees may not perform um, any uh, work. Now, the next bullet point is the one where I have to say ignore that uh, because um, when I was writing uh, the presentation over the weekend and trying to work out how furlough, which actually isn't a term that exists uh, in Britain, uh, certainly not in UK employment law, it's an American concept, I was trying to work out based on the few words uh, that the Chancellor had uh, come up with um, uh, was that... Um, uh, furlough was synonymous with temporary layoff. 
um, the general um, balance of opinion uh, in this area, and this is reflected in the um, Managing Disruption uh, Guide um, on, on the web page, um, is that actually furlough is different uh, from uh, temporary layoff and is not subject to quite the same uh, restrictions um, as uh, as temporary uh, layoff. So um, the, the one thing that does stay the same is you are effectively changing the contract of employment uh, therefore you do need um, agreement. You do need uh, agreement uh, with your employees. Uh, the second uh, sub bullet point uh, that relates to specific rules on layoff with regard to individuals being able to apply for redundancy after four weeks, ignore that. Uh, that is not uh, correct. So far as we uh, understand it to be, we're still waiting, of course, for the government to provide any further detail. It may very well be. I think it's unlikely. But in the event that the, the government comes along and says in their guidance that it is the same as layoff, uh, then I will be proved right and, uh, and everyone else will be proved wrong. But um, I, I believe um, that uh, the policy behind this is to make furlough uh, as straightforward and as attractive as possible. And therefore, I do not believe it's likely that the government will um, uh, latch it on uh, to temporary uh, layoff. Um, but I mean, just in terms of the sting in the tail, obviously, uh, with regard uh, to the fact that you cannot use furlough uh, for um, people who do any work is it does at the moment uh, restrict you, prevent you from applying it to people who may continue working for you, uh, perhaps uh, in response to you know, emergency demands. Um, uh, so in the event that you're operating effectively a reduced hours arrangement, uh, which of course, um, as far as the general law is concerned, you're perfectly entitled to agree uh, with your employees. Uh, if you're operating that, then you and they uh, carry the risk as regards uh, maintaining uh, the level um, of earnings. Now, we believe at ECA uh, that that, from a policy point of view, is wrong. Um, and I think this is one area, again, where this concept of critical worker uh, will come into play. I don't think at the moment that um, government and others fully understand uh, some of the critical work that will need to be done to maintain, for example, hospitals, uh, schools and other essential parts of our infrastructure. Um, ECA, is, ECA is making it very clear uh, and communicating that extremely clear. Um, and uh, so we are lobbying for the government to relax uh, that requirement. We think it's a perverse disincentive uh, for employers and employees um, if uh, you, you effectively force um, everybody uh, to um, uh, shut up shop. Um, now, for, for, for some people, shutting up shop uh, may be the only uh, reasonable option, the only realistic option. Um, I do believe that for many uh, clients um, and contractors who are providing um, ongoing maintenance, repair, emergency cover, that kind of thing, uh, there does need to be an incentive um, for, for that to continue. And um, we'll just have to hope uh, that that is persuasive. Um, the JIB. I know there are a number of JIB uh, companies um, on the call. Um, I, I've seen some comments from them. I mean, obviously, from an ECA point of view, um, the world has changed somewhat, and now only a minority of, of members are in the JIB. But they do include some of the most prominent uh, businesses um, in the in in the in, in the industry. Um, and obviously, the JIB remains uh, an important institution in the agreement, an important benchmark for terms and conditions throughout the industry, whether you're a, a JIB member or not. Um, Two, two issues uh, to be deal to, to deal with. One relatively straightforward. Uh, the other, um, at the moment, uh, I can't give people a definitive answer, uh, but I'll, I'll explain. I'll explain a, a bit as far as I can where we're at. Uh, in terms of uh, JIB uh, sick pay, um, the additional sick pay. Um, uh, that kicks in after two weeks. Um, well, the two-week qualifying period uh, there uh, remains um, in place. Um, there's been no equivalent uh, waiver of the waiting period um, mm -hmm. uh, for additional sick pay under the JIB. Um, in terms of 
um, who is entitled to the additional sick pay. Uh, once again, um, there are specific rules of the scheme um, and um, those um, uh, we, we now believe um, will be uh, confirmed uh, to the industry uh, and to those who have a policy uh, under the JRB benefit scheme uh, very soon, in, in the next um, day or so, I would say. Um, in, and I think I, I won't be telling tales out of school if I confirm to you that clearly people who are uh, uh, have been um, confirmed as infected uh, with coronavirus, um, they clearly will be entitled to sick pay. And my understanding is those who are self-isolating on medical advice, uh, NHS 111, uh, likewise uh, will qualify for the JIB additional sick pay uh, and the two week uh, and, and, and a period of self-isolation um, Will, will be included in the waiting period for the purposes of the two weeks. So um, if you're still after two weeks uh, self-isolating, uh, then the sick pay will uh, kick in. Um, now, the next uh, two bullet points relate to the fundamental issue, which I know is exercising uh, JIB members. Uh, it's been exercising JIB members for some time, ever since there was a prospect um, of uh, an industry um, lockdown, uh, a, a reduction in, in the available work. Uh, it's been given uh, greater um, urgency uh, now with the uh, announcements over the last uh, 24 hours. Um, and, um, and of course, also uh, the profile uh, given to um, the uh, job um, retention uh, scheme, which of course for many companies uh, faced uh, with the prospect of not wanting to make their employees uh, redundant or, or to lay them off with very little uh, financial support, um, then uh, that needs, uh, that, that, that means that this is of, of really crucial significance. The, the issue you have uh, with the JIB um, is the 37 and a half hours uh, guarantee. Um, the other issue you have, which differentiates you if you're a JIB member, as opposed to a non-JIB member, is that you are subject to a collective agreement, an agreement that is negotiated by other people. Um, and those people or those entities um, are ECA and Unite. So um, to, 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 to achieve um, a, a, a relaxation um, of that, uh, you likewise uh, need to have uh, that agreement. Um, what I can say um, is uh, that we have been discussing this uh, with uh, Unite, um, and I'm reasonably confident um, within the next day or at most two, there will be some communication or other. I can't say what that communication will be, um, but I can confirm that there will be some communication or other uh, coming out um, about that. Um, of course, at the moment, the issue is, is that the job retention scheme with 80% pay uh, might not be consistent uh, with the 37 and a half hours guarantee. Although, again, I put the proviso there uh, that because we don't know what the 80% is 80% of, uh, we, we still have to wait for the government uh, to define that for us uh, more clearly than has been the case so far. Um, All right, um, sources of further information and advice. I've already mentioned it uh, more than once, but I do commend to you uh, the coronavirus uh, webpage. Um, uh, and I mentioned the two main pieces of employee relations guidance there, uh, dealing with the impact of coronavirus, that's specifically relevant really to the issue of statutory uh, sick pay um, and managing business disruption which encompasses all the options uh, you have. Um, it does deal with the issue of furlough leave. It also deals with other options uh, such as reduced hours working, uh, such as uh, bringing forward um, annual leave uh, and other arrangements that you could conceivably agree uh, with your employees um, around um, uh, unpaid leave uh, and so on. Um, I would also commend you uh, to the helpline. Obviously, the purpose of, of today's 
uh, web webinar it is to talk in broad terms, in general terms. Uh, I know everyone has specific circumstances uh, and that can affect um, uh, where, um, uh, what the answer is, what the correct answer is. You may also, of course, have detailed questions uh, uh, about process. Um, and indeed, uh, in two or three days' time, uh, the the experts who uh, man uh, that uh, helpline may very well have uh, further information uh, to have their fingertips, which you will find helpful in your own particular uh, circumstances. Um, so I do commend uh, you uh, to that. Uh, we, all I would say is we have been uh, very busy, uh, as I know the other helplines have been. We exist here to support you. Um, to give you uh, pragmatic advice, um, uh, but to set out for you uh, the various options uh, and the risks uh, of, of adopting uh, option A, option B, option C. Um, I'm going to finish now only, only to add that that coronavirus webpage is, um, is updated daily at the moment. So keep watching. Um, if you're not getting the e-bulletins, uh, then uh, they are also uh, being posted uh, on the, on the web page, uh, and they will provide a sort of a daily update, which sort of is a good companion uh, to what's on the uh, coronavirus uh, web page uh, itself. Okay, I think that's it from me. Um, uh, I don't think I've got a question slide, uh, but I will wait instructions as to uh, what questions uh, Mike wants to ask me on your behalf. Thanks, Andrew. Um, as you all heard, Andrew did cover quite a few of your questions during his presentation. So thanks for that. But just just a few that I picked up on, uh, hopefully you can help out um, listeners. Um, furloughed workers came up a fair bit and you did cover quite a lot, Andrew. Um, one of them was though, can you furlough a worker and then potentially bring them back and then potentially furlough them again? What level of flexibility is or isn't really? Um, well, the short answer, I'm afraid, uh, to that question, and I, it, it might be uh, an answer to more questions about furloughed workers, is we have no clear uh, indication from the government yet what the rules are. Uh, I would say, in principle, um, uh, uh, I could see um, uh, uh, circumstances where uh, you would be arguing um, that um, at, the, at a particular moment in time, um, there, this individual was at risk of redundancy, was an issue of being uh, at risk of being laid off. Uh, but then circumstances change. I have to say, one of the other um, policy arguments that uh, ECI, ECA has been um, putting forward uh, as part of representing your interests is we put forward the idea of um, rotating people. Um, I, I know that, that one of the issues that some people are concerned about is this division of the workforce between those who are working and those who are staying at home. And, and, and the issue, and I think it's a very real employer relations issue, uh, about the people who are working um, feeling somewhat hard done by uh, compared to their colleagues who are happily um, uh, sitting at home and being paid you know, not the same as them, but 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 not not far off. Um, so we have suggested uh, that the uh, revenue and customs should be more flexible and allow for some kind of, of rotation. Um, again, uh, there's been no response on that and we're still awaiting the guidance. But that, I think, combined with greater flexibility for reduced hours working, but with the job retention scheme um, underwriting that, um, we believe is a much more sensible approach. But we do appreciate, of course, that the government have already come a long way uh, in supporting uh, employers. We just feel that... Uh, given that this is likely to go on for some time, uh, they need to do just a bit more. Thanks, Andrew. Just in terms of, of the furloughing process, am I, just to clarify, can any business make that decision for the reasons they determine in the circumstances? Are there any restrictions on what they can do or anything that they should have regard for? Well, um, well um, as I said, um, the initial guidance, and I don't think, um, uh, uh, well, I don't know that the, the, guide, the, the guidance will change when we get more detail. I, I imagine it will remain consistent. Uh, the initial guidance is that you only furlough people uh, who otherwise uh, you would be laying off or making redundant. Um, that said, 
uh, that does leave uh, uh, some discretion uh, to an employer. Um, and um, I don't believe at the moment, I am not aware uh, at the moment that there are any evidence uh, requirements uh, that you would have to uh, provide uh, for that. And I think it would be unwieldy, given that we are talking about potentially millions of people working for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of organizations. Um, I do not believe that it's likely um, that uh, there will be uh, significant evidence requirements above and beyond, of course, uh, the evidence that the uh, revenue already has, uh, which is the evidence of previous payments. So um, I would say that the, the rules are the rules. Um, uh, I think, though, that in practice, employers will have a, a considerable degree of discretion. What at the moment they won't have a discretion about is 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 getting people furloughed people uh, uh, to do work for them. Um, that 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 from as far as the revenue and customs are concerned is is is, is not acceptable, not allowable. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, we're going to wrap up now, but um, what we'll endeavour to do is get the webinar up online as soon as possible afterwards, and also we'll be reviewing all of the chat when we can to try and see if we've uh, missed anything off off there. Uh, as you know, you can uh, find that information uh, from www.eca.co.uk forward slash coronavirus, or you can get in contact with our helplines who will do our best to help you when we can. So thanks, everyone, for taking the time. Thanks to our presenters and uh, goodbye.